Oh, hi. I'm John from Oddman. For over 100 years, researchers have tried to understand how our brains turn raw vibrations into perception. Today, I want to show you how those discoveries led to new ways of visualizing and shaping sound the way we really hear it. Recently, I posted several videos diving into the functionality of the Odd One, and I was asked about the main sound visualization used for the audio sample. That visualization is something I've been excited about since the very beginning of the project. It's called a spectrogram, and more specifically, it's what we might call an auditory spectrogram. After being asked about it, I thought about how I've spent almost 30 years working with sound, from early explorations and music production, through graduate research in signal processing and hearing science, through building audio features for companies like Apple and Samsung, and now designing instruments like the Odd One. It's easy for me to forget that what feels like a natural way to view and understand sound may be new to many people. So I wanted to share a bit more about the auditory spectrogram, its history, and why it can help us see sound more like the way we hear it. We've understood that sound is a wave moving through air for hundreds of years, but most sounds, especially musical sounds, are complex vibrations. If you've ever looked at an audio waveform, you know that unless it's a simple sound, it's almost impossible to decipher what's happening by eye. Here's a sample provided for the Odd One Library by musician and producer Lee Clark. Before we listen, look at the waveform. We can see amplitude changes, sudden attacks, slower fades, but not much more. Now let's listen. As listeners, we know far more than the waveforms seem to show. We hear a trumpet playing melodic phrases, a Rhodes keyboard playing arpeggios, jazz-infused harmonies, repetition, and a final flourish. Our auditory system somehow separates instruments, tracks melody, feels rhythm, and recognizes timbre almost instantly. So how do we do that? One of the most important breakthroughs in our understanding came from Joseph Fourier in the early 1800s. Fourier discovered that any complex vibration can be represented as the addition of simple sine waves. This unlocked the ability to analyze sound in terms of frequency. But Fourier analysis reveals only a clear picture for steady, unchanging sounds. Real-world sounds change continuously over time. So the question became, how do we analyze frequency as it evolves through time? In 1946, Dennis Gabor asked exactly that question. How precisely can we know both the time position and the frequency content of a sound? He discovered a fundamental trade-off. Increasing resolution in time decreases resolution in frequency. To work within that trade-off, he proposed slicing audio into short time windows and applying Fourier analysis to each segment. This technique, what we now call the short time Fourier transform, became the basis of the modern spectrogram. This innovation is also frequently cited as the conceptual origin of granular synthesis. But Gabor's method had a limitation. The window size he used was fixed, which leads to having the same frequency resolution at both low and high frequencies. That's not how our auditory system works. Beginning as early as the 1930s, researchers such as Harvey Fletcher at Bell Labs started to understand that the ear didn't have the same resolution. Fletcher, the same Fletcher, people refer to him as the father of stereophonic sound. I mean, this guy was pretty unbelievable. It's really actually even the same paper from 1933 from Fletcher and his colleague Munson. They established both the equal loudness contours that most audio engineers would be familiar with. So in that same paper, Fletcher and Munson started to demonstrate that there was a finer resolution at low frequencies and less resolution at high frequencies. Later, many others demonstrated that the auditory system divides frequency into non-uniform critical bands. All of this work led to critical band filter banks of the Bark scale. We have Dr. Barkhausen involved, one of the best names in the business. The ERB scale, or the equivalent rectangular bandwidth scale, and what are called gamma-tone cochlear models. There are also more mathematically inspired transforms, such as the constant Q transform, and wavelets, 
which stretch time windows at low frequencies and shrink them at high frequencies. My personal connection was the first company that I worked for out of graduate school created an auditory filter bank they called the Fast Cochlea Transform. This was the basis for performing cell phone noise reduction, much like the human auditory system can pay attention to an individual sound in a complex environment. Almost any time you're having a phone call or on a video chat, there's noise reduction technology being used to try to differentiate your voice from the background noise. And now let's come back to instrument design. If our auditory system analyzes sound through a nonlinear time frequency lens, and if so much creative intuition comes from perceiving that structure, then why shouldn't our tools give us access to something closer to what the ear is doing? That idea is what led me to use an auditory-inspired spectrogram for the primary visualization of the odd one. Instead of a waveform, we use a representation inspired by auditory critical bands. Narrower resolution in the lows and wider in the highs. It lets us see harmonic structure, transients, vibrato, formants, noise bursts, and chord voicings in ways a waveform simply can't. And those same principles show up in the sound engine itself. One feature I'm particularly excited about is the grain level bandpass filter, where the bandwidth scales with center frequency. Again, like auditory filtering, this is available as an auxiliary parameter on the grains functionality, where you see bandwidth and center available on the screen. Let me start a drum loop. I have an LFO controlling the binaural placement, so you should hear it circling around your head if you're listening over headphones. Now let me reduce the bandwidth. Okay, it's much thinner sounding. And now I'm going to control the center. There's a certain amount of evenness. because the bandwidth is actually much larger as I've moved the center up here. It sounds thinner, of course, because it's the high frequencies, but I'm controlling the bandwidth according to that gamma tone filter function that I mentioned. So now if I modulate that with an LFO, which is just going between one and negative one, There's a very perceptually smooth transition from low to high and a very even amount of bandwidth across the whole range. Let me decrease the bandwidth more. Sharper, but again, still even across the low and high frequencies. This is especially nice if we randomize the center frequency because in some ways we can kind of reconstruct the full bandwidth, especially if we make the sound more dense. Now we're getting, to a large extent, the full bandwidth of the drums, but through the combination of many pieces. So the goal was simple. If we can reveal sound more like the way we hear it, we can compose, experiment, and improvise with a deeper understanding. We're going to look at innovations that shape modern sound synthesis and effects processing, and how they continue to influence new instrument design. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.